what um, I want to give a little preface to what we're going to do t now, is, which is the title is Funding and Other Support, again, from our um, HHS agencies. And the thought around this actually came out of the ad hoc work group, which was um, while there isn't a very much targeted funding for chronic fatigue syndrome, and, and that is an unfortunate thing within the federal government, there are actually many opportunities that um, for funding that we should all understand. I really appreciate, for example, Susan's discussion because uh, already because NIH is the big gorilla when we're talking about research funding. Is that the gorilla in the room? <laughs> <laughs> um, it has much more than anybody else in of the HHS agencies um, combined. Um, and so, but these are opportunities that the research community, which by and large does not represent the federal government, most research, biomedical research in this country, the vast majority occurs in academic centers and uh, research foundations. And so, and those opportunities have to be taken. And these are independent researchers, and we at HHS cannot tell them what research they're going to do. And so we want um, the committee members and um, our, our audience at large to understand the opportunities and to develop ways to um, nurture, to inform, to collaborate with academic researchers around the country um, to encourage them to apply for these opportunities and to develop these opportunities. Um, the vast majority, I think Susan just said it a few moments ago, the vast majority of the research funds that come out of NIH, that are awarded by NIH, are investigator initiated. That means these are non-federal investigators who write a proposal and send it into NIH and it's a good proposal and it successfully competes with less good proposals on this topic or many others. And that is a very important uh, way that this business of funding research by the federal government has been going on for decades. And so I thought it would be a good opportunity today um, for us all to learn about these opportunities and to think about ways that we can um, encourage um, non-federal non non researchers to get into the business of applying successfully for these funds. Again, the federal government cannot tell, the, and we don't want to tell these academic researchers what to do, but we want to um, let them know that this, these opportunities exist, and it's not just NIH funding, so that's one of the things that we're going to talk about today. So um, let me just start with Beth. Thank you. <laughs> um, I really appreciate being able to have this discussion because um, we've heard over and over about how there isn't enough um, research and how frustrating that is. Um, and it's frustrating from this side of the money um, as well. And so um, I, I welcome um, this discussion. Uh, I'm, get, I'm pausing for a moment because um, some of the things I was thinking about um, saying have already been said, so I, I'll probably um, emphasize um, most of the points that have already been, been made. Um, the two, I'm thinking about this um, as in other discussions that I've had with um, investigators or professional societies who come and say, who say, come and talk about ARC and what the funding opportunities are. And they always seem a little bit surprised that ARC potentially um, might, might be a, f a fit for some of the people who are there. So I'll tell you um, some of the messages that, that I give out. And um, I appreciate Dane's um, comments earlier because the most important message that I um, highlight is to call a project officer. Um, and, uh, and to have, if you don't already, um, a concept paper 
put together a uh, one to two page um, concept paper. So that the first question that a project officer is going to have with someone is about whether there's a fit um, with the particular agency and um, or within a particular RFA. And when people call me, for example, um, they often are thinking about one particular request for proposals, and I might actually point them in another um, direction. Um, and this is an important point because I may, in fact, refer somebody somewhere else. I may say, the, or any project officer may say, gee, sorry, it's not a fit. Why don't you try somewhere else? And um, that's a hard message to deliver, but um, I think it's important so that um, investigators don't waste time um, applying for grants for which there is not a, a good fit. Um, and that's another point, is that these take a lot of work, um, a lot of work to put together um, a proposal. And it may take several rounds um, before a proposal is actually um, um, funded. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a lot of work and we recognize that. So w what we wanna do is to make sure that it's a, um, a good fit. Um, and if we have to refer you um, out somewhere else. The second thing we look at when once we determine that it's a good fit is the team. And is the research team gonna be able to, to do this um, research? Sometimes creating a good team means that you need to bring on collaborators that may not even be in chronic fatigue syndrome, for example. Um, and perhaps um, it would be a strategy to become the second investigator, for example, which I know presents after 20 odd years of um, time in academic setting. I know what the pressures are to be the principal investigator and to get funding and that sort of thing. But in the long haul, it may be that you, you sign on to somebody else's um, grant that, um, um, could then pan out for you. So who, for example, would not have loved to have been in the room when the Project ECHO or other similar projects were being developed and they were saying, well, what disease are we gonna focus this uh, telemedicine project on? And they decided, somebody said hepatitis C. Um, or, or what can we do about hepatitis C? And don't you wish that you were there and said, well, what about chronic fatigue syndrome? You know, this might be a good model for this particular um, intervention. So um, collaboration is a, an imp important thing. And I think making connections with other um, investigators that you might not think of otherwise, um, such as the example that Susan gave, where the researcher um, from NINR, the Nursing um, Research um, Institute, um, is going to take a related topic and now has been introduced to this idea of chronic fatigue syndrome and um, you know, now we'll be taking a, a closer look. So making friends with um, investigators that you might not have thought of um, before. And one way that you can do that then during, uh, to look for collaborators is to look at other research that's been funded um, by a particular agency. And this is important for two reasons. Well, several reasons. But one is it tells you if there's fit. It gives you an idea for potential collaborators or consultants. And third, if it's already been done, it's going to be a hard sell to have additional funding going for a project that looks uh, like it's going to be a, a replication. Um, we want to spread the money out as, as much as, as we can. Um, and then the final comment I guess I'll make um, in terms of, of fit and mechanisms, because it, the, the um, Agency for Healthcare Research and, and Quality, because our portfolios are um, a little bit um, different, the, um, and the funding stream may be different, and so you may need to think about adjusting um, your concept um, to fit. 
That's not adjusting your um, research necessarily, or uh, nobody would recommend that, that you adjust that. But there, there may be an aspect, a wrinkle to it that you had not um, thought of before, or um, that uh, the focus of a particular area may be evolving. For example, in our um, patient-centered outcomes research or comparative effectiveness research portfolio, that started out being funded by the Medicare Modernization Act. Then it was funded by the Recovery Act. And uh, uh, let me backtrack a second. So the Medicare Modernization Act, then focus was naturally on Medicare and Medicaid populations, on the, on the, uh, the health services for those populations. Then the Recovery Act um, came along, gave um, money to fund in this program, gave um, <laughs> authorized money for this program, and so then uh, comparative effectiveness uh, was one of the provisions um, in that funding stream. Um, now there are Affordable Care Act um, provisions that are funding patient-centered outcomes um, research. And so with each of these, it's um, uh, a, li a little wrinkle um, as the science evolves and as the topics um, evolve. The other thing to say about the Aff Affordable Care Act um, funding is that um, it is a stream of money that for funding that the TAP has just is just now being opened. And there will be, assuming uh, the positives going forward, that this funding stream will continue um, and that the TAP will be opened. And that TAP is going to a number of, of place, places. And, um, and um, uh, HCPR, it, or HCPR, I can't believe I said the old name. I'm really, yes. Uh, HRQ is um, one of those uh, places. I can't think of a more a place where research needs to be more patient-centered <laughs> than in uh, MECSF. So I think that this is, uh, that's a personal statement, by the way. But um, uh, here's an opportunity with, with um, patient-centered um, outcomes research that this uh, funding may be applicable to you. So um, if you were to call me up with a concept, um, then um, we could talk about how that might apply. But I may say to you, you need to go talk to NIH because that funding stream is going to NIH too. Um, and it's going a number, and it's also going to the PCORI, the Private Public Partnership Institute. And that might be um, a better fit for you. So for example, with the PCOR, Patient Centered Outcomes Research Dollars, we at, at, at ARC are focusing on methodology, dissemination, and training. So that's a real uh, specific um, focus. And there may be something in that that fits, but that's a little bit different focus than what NIH and uh, PCOR, PCORI, sorry, PCORI, um, will be focusing um, on. Um, the one example I wanted to give you um, of some, one of the methodology projects um, that is being worked on right now is registry of registries. And this was just um, uh, published information, a white paper on May 31st. Um, as by way of background, you know the agency's done a, a fair amount of methodologic work on registries, patient registries. And there is a registries handbook, which is wonderful resource. Um, it can provide a lot of technical support. It's in its second edition. The third edition is um, coming now. Um, and some of the drafts will be out for uh, public comment. But the third edition is coming. The second edition is wonderful. Um, so I highly recommend those of you who are interested in patient registries to take a, a look at that. But at the same time, ARC recognized that um, there was a need for what we're calling a registry of registries. So along this model of clinicaltrials.gov, so that there is one central place, a searchable database, to find out about patient registries, so that the power of these registries can be amplified. 
um, by finding and having similar da uh, data elements and uh, creating the, the methods for these um, uh, and operational methods for these uh, registries so that everyone can um, benefit from that and there can be a transparent um, sort of, of, of process. Um, I know those are random thoughts um, and I apologize for being all, all over the place, but I really appreciate the opportunity and look forward to hear what you have to say about um, these thoughts that are from a different sort of perspective than perhaps we've considered before. Thanks, Beth. That's great. Um, I, I think I'll go in alphabetical order. So um, we'll do CDC next. I just want to say a, a couple of addendums to my earlier remarks. The first is that most of the money that goes out from the federal government for biomedical issues is, is research, but there is some that is not research. And so, uh, and we have some of the, those agencies around the table, so just not all of this is research per se. And the second thing is, I just want to um, um, say another thing. Last meeting we had, um, there was a talk about the need to, um, for NIH specifically, to reach out to CFS researchers and court them. And I think that's a very difficult task for all of these agencies to do. We have not just, CFS is not the only agenda item for res research or other activities. Um, and so we have these existing mechanisms for funding for many, many biomedical issues. And um, they are there, and academic, this is the lifeblood of academia anyway. They know about how you apply for these funds. So. Um, but I think there's real opportunity for the energy that I see over and over again from the patient groups to collaborate, to nurture these academic researchers and, these, uh, and help them come up with ideas. And it happens all the time for many advocacy groups. And so um, we do what we can, um, but I think there's a real opportunity for uh, the advocacy groups for the patient centered for the patient gr organizations that are um, that have CFS as their mission to really work with academic researchers to build the the capacity and the funding that they could get for CFS through these existing um, mechanisms. So w with that, um, I think I would like to go around. Is that all right, Eileen? I just had a question about the graph. About um, uh, the fiscal Let, Let's graph? do that at the end. Okay. But when we hear from everyone. David. Okay. okay. Um, Armius. Yeah, uh, I'll try to keep it very brief. <laughs> CDC does not have an uh, investigator initiated funding opportunity the way NIH does, uh, not just for CFS, but for other diseases. It's just not our mandate. Um, so there are no specific investigator initiating, initiated funding opportunities the way NIH makes it available because it's not our mandate. Um, those dollars go to NIH specifically. Um, having said that, uh, we have specific budget for, uh, for CFS, uh, which ranges from four to five million dollars a year. Um, and a good chunk of that funding is actually used to pay for the kind of activities that I described yesterday, um, specifically for provider education to purchase the uh, CME credits, to buy the contract for the CME credits, uh, and also the uh, standard standardized uh, patient that I referred to that uh, yesterday. We have the contract with that outside agency to develop that standardized patient for potential incorporation into medical school cu curriculum. So provider education in different formats, different, different ways are paid for uh, through a contract mechanism that we have. Uh, the other way we, the, uh, that, that we use our funding for supporting activities uh, is, if, for example, yesterday I mentioned the, um, the uh, multi-site clinic studies the seven clinic studies that, that we are funding. Again, some of the money that we have is used to, 
to fund that project. And, uh, and, and how did that money get put out? We usually use a cooperative agreement mechanism, uh, which is different from grants and, and uh, investigator-initiated R01 and, and the, other, the other approaches that NIH uses. So it's, it's a very... It was, it was competitive, though. Uh, it's uh, cooperative agreements are potentially competitive. Yes, they're open to, to you know, a lot of researchers to apply for. The only difference is the idea about the research and the activities and the projects are initiated by CDC. That's the difference. Uh, other than that, it's it's a it's a competitive process. Um, in the other activities that we fund, is the uh, pathogen discovery that I mentioned yesterday with the uh, institute in California. Uh, again, that's, a spe that's actually a specific contract because we have a specific question that we'd like to address, scientific question, and then uh, we target that funding to a specific laboratory, and that's how we funded that activity, the pathogen discovery. And that was competitive? Uh, I have to check on that, but I, I think it was a contract. When it's a contract, it doesn't have to be competitive. But it may be. It could be, but you could, it's like purchasing a service. I mean, it, there's a lot of funding jargon, but I don't want to get into into the details. Uh, that's pretty much it from CDC, unless you have specific questions. I was just emphasizing the competitive part because that's, again, an opportunity, when, especially when things are competitive, that people can come in with their application. Definitely. Uh, when, uh, when we put out the cooperative agreement, it's open for anyone to... Right submit the applications, and, 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 and our, that's how we was funded. Right, and our plan is, uh, and I think we have done this in the past, is when such specific CFS opportunities come out that we can then um, notice, put a notice out on our website in a, a link, and with the listserv that we're trying to publicize, we could get that out more. Um, that, that, that's usually announced on uh, grants.gov, I believe, the government-wide uh, website that actually lists the different cooperative agreements and opportunities that are available. Um, I think I want to just break a moment because we have a new person at the table, <laughs> um, Dr. Lisa Corbin, who has come to us from a red-eye flight, right? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Such a, such a good, we really appreciate your, um, thank you, uh, Marty, we really appreciate your effort to get here. Uh, she is the Associate Professor, Department of General Internal Medicine at the University of Colorado, uh, Denver School of Medicine, and she's served as the Medical Director for, of the Center for Integrative Medicine at the hospital at University of Colorado, and uh, she is... Um, there's a clinic associated with this, and she has seen a diverse set of referred patients for chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia and uses complementary and alternative medicine approaches to care for patients. Um, she is an expert in complementary and alternative medicine and incorporates this this pr these principles with traditional medicine in her practice. Um, she also conducts research in chronic fatigue and pain through the incorporation of integrative medicine. So uh, thank you, Dr. Corbin. Do you have anything else to add? Um, okay, good. Yeah, and, and we always have to use this thing, and we, we help each other by reminding. Good. Thank you. And so we're so glad you're here and appreciate your efforts at getting here for the second day. So oh, um, let's have, since CMS follow CDC in the alphabet, let's have Elaine go. And I know, Elaine, you have a couple of slides. No, 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 no I okay. don't, actually. No. Uh, but, but the uh, list of websites that I handed out also contains uh, the website for the Innovation Center, which I'm going to talk about. So you, you already have that. Okay, so uh, I mentioned in my earlier presentation the uh, CMS Innovation Center, which was one of the products of the Affordable Care Act. And so I want to talk a little bit more about uh, what they do and how that's relevant potentially uh, for us uh, dealing with CFS. Uh, the, basically, the Innovation Center was established by the Affordable Care Act to test innovative payment and service delivery models to reduce program expenditures in uh, the Medicare and Medicaid programs uh, while preserving or enhancing the quality of care. 
for patients. And basically their goal, you know, more in plain English, is, is to uh, make transformations in the healthcare system where through improvements and innovations in the healthcare system, quality of care and access to care for patients can be improved at the same time that costs are lowered. So uh, that is their goal. And their basic process is working with a very broad range of stakeholders to solicit ideas for innovative models, uh, then select and develop those models to test them, to evaluate them, and then models that are successful, uh, they would then work to disseminate and spread more widely. Uh, and their focus, of course, is on Medicare, Medicaid, and, and the Children's Health Insurance Program, the programs that we run, but they are very interested in things that also can apply more broadly. So it's really about uh, seeking better ways to do health care, not just, not just the you know, Medicare and Medicaid programs. So some of the kinds of things that um, models that they've been developing or, uh, or testing, um, things to do using telemedicine, using uh, more integrated multidisciplinary approaches to care, using a non-physician care to uh, kind of extend uh, capacity, uh, a lot of emphasis on care coordination, on increasing emphasis on primary care, uh, testing different payment models, such as providing compensation for care management. Um, they've funded, uh, a, a lot of the uh, programs are, are general uh, and would apply you know, to across uh, different diseases, but they also do have some disease-specific programs. Um, um, there's, uh, they've done uh, grants for uh, a program on chronic pain, on stroke, on asthma, just to give a few examples. Uh, they also, I actually just noticed one of, uh, they'd recently gave an award to a, uh, to, I, I guess it's part of uh, Project ECHO or it's, um, the same organization that's doing Project Ecto is now getting some funding from the Innovation Center, so that was interesting to see. Uh, so I had mentioned at an earlier point, uh, I think I sent out some information to the committee about healthcare innovation grants. So these were announced in the fall, and they, had, they did uh, close applications for those, for the first round of those in the winter, and they actually have already awarded some of them. They're going to announce more awards at a later point. They had said when they announced the first round that they may or may not announce a second round, uh, open a, it up for a second round of applications. They have not made a decision yet about whether there will be a second round, so that is still pending. Um, I will keep you informed about <laughs> what happens with that, but I don't know at this point. But what I do want to talk about is a, another approach with the Innovation Center, which is what they refer to as their pipeline process. And basically the way this works is it's, it's a little different than a typical, uh, it's, it's not a, a solicitation or sort of the typical approach that you would see. Uh, basically they are inviting any uh, stakeholders to come up with ideas for models that they should test. So it's kind of getting it on the ground floor, as Beth was talking about. Um, and this is something where, you know, it uh, could be any individuals from CIFSAC. It could be people outside of CIFSAC. Uh, it, you know, it could be, you know, a couple people in CIFSAC uh, bringing in some of their colleagues from outside. You know, any any group, any kind of working group could, could pull together and work on coming up with a model. And... I would be happy to provide technical assistance and, and you know, brainstorm about ideas. Uh, also, the Innovation Center is, um, you know, very open to providing technical assistance. Um, and what they would be looking for are, again, their charge is to find ways through innovation, through improvement, to both lower costs and improve quality at the same time. Uh, Lowering costs could be in the short term or it could be in the longer term. Uh, one thing that they do really require is the development of a really clear business plan and a, a really uh, convincing demonstration that the intervention 
will the model that uh, is developed would put, you know, put uh, us on the path to both improving quality and reducing cost. And so, you know, that, you know, it would require a business plan with numbers and figures and, and a, a strong rationale for how that could work. Um, they very much encourage collaboration with other HHS agencies. So, you know, I think if, if there were other agencies that wanted to come together, uh, they, you know, that would be looked upon favorably. Uh, and so I think, you know, some of the kinds of ideas that we've been talking about um, all along about, you know, the project doing something similar to the Project ECHO model uh, and, you know, other, other, other ideas. Um, I mean, I think, you know, the door is, you know, just kind of open to brainstorming and, you know, it would be something where we would need to sit down and, you know, have, have brainstorming conversations about what type of model might be uh, helpful to people with CFS and uh, advance healthcare, you know, for this population treatment and healthcare for this population and also be something that can meet their criteria for uh, showing cost savings in the short or long term. So, uh, and then the, what's interesting about the process then is that, you know, if we came up with an idea for a model um, then that they accepted, at that point they would then go out with a solicitation. So they would, you know, whether uh, it could be through cooperative agreements, through grants, through contracts, but that, that is the point at which it would become a competitive process. And it would be open to anyone who met the criteria and wanted to apply to uh, submit an application to test the model that, that had been outlined and developed. Uh, so the group who came up with the idea could apply, but they wouldn't necessarily be selected, although one would think that they would probably have a strong uh, you know, um, application. Um, but so it becomes a competitive process at that stage. So uh, it's something that um, obviously would take a lot of outside work, outside of you know <laughs> this meeting uh, to uh, have discussions about people's ideas for what a model might look like. and and how a business case could be developed for that. But I'm definitely very willing to engage in any conversations with, with anyone who's interested uh, on the committee or, or off the committee. So thank you. Thanks very much, Elaine. Um, if um, now we can have Terry talk from FDA. Okay, thank you very much. So I want to start off with just a little bit of background about FDA because we are essentially a fundamentally different agency than many of the others that you've heard of here today in that we are a regulatory agency. So we are responsible for actually regulating a large portion of the consumer products that people use every day. And this includes some things that don't necessarily apply to what we're thinking about here the foods, the veterinary products, and the tobacco products. The three groups at the agency that focus more specifically on health products would be the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, which essentially does vaccines and blood products, the Center for Radiologic and Devices, and they are what they say they are, and finally, the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. And that's the one that I'm going to focus on um, because that's the area that I think probably applies most closely to the work of this committee. So just to correct one misconception that I've heard in some of the advocacy groups, there was a request put out yesterday to accelerate the FDA pipeline for MECSF. And just to be very clear, we don't have a pipeline. We don't have a pipeline for asthma or cancer or anything else because we don't do drug development. What we do is regulate drugs that come in that are in the process of being developed and that are out in the market. So the pharmaceutical companies have a pipeline. 
and we try to facilitate that process and make sure that the products that are, get out on the market are both safe and effective. With that said, we don't really fund drug development either. That's up to the pharmaceutical companies to fund drug development or, you know, individual investigators who, or whoever else is really out there doing drug development. There are some opportunities, though, for funding and for um, facilitating this kind of development. Sponsors actually pay user fees whenever a product comes to FDA for approval for marketing. There are several situations under which those user fees are waived. One is the first approval of a drug by a small business, and that's written right into the laws. So there are specific criteria of what qualifies as a small business, but if a company is small and there's certain numbers of employees and so forth, and they do not have a product on the market yet, they can qualify for a waiver of that user fee. With that said, there's a whole lot of money that goes into drug development before you get to that point. This is after you have your drug, you've done all your testing, and you're, you're ready to put it on the market. Uh, there are also waivers of user fees for orphan products. Now, chronic fatigue syndrome, as you've all heard about, there are many people now with chronic fatigue syndrome, and the, the actual numbers vary depending on who you talk to. But to qualify for orphan status, you have to have fewer than 200,000 individuals with the disease in the United States. So once upon a time, years ago, chronic fatigue syndrome did qualify for orphan status, but it no longer does. So if a new company comes to us and asks for orphan drug status, chronic fatigue doesn't qualify at this point in time. The other place that uh, companies can get not waivers of user fees, but additional marketing exclusivity, which ties into um, a great deal of money for these companies, is in pediatrics. So once you have a product that's on the market, you can ask for a pediatric written request, in which case, um, if your product qualifies by doing the correct pediatric studies, you can get an additional six months of marketing exclusivity. So that's a way that once we're down further along the road, we can look at making sure that these products that would eventually become available for chronic fatigue syndrome could apply to a pediatric market. I'll also refer you to our website. There are links there that take you to the Small Business Administration. And there are specific grants and loans that are available through the Small Business Administration that could be used for drug development. So if you go to the FDA website, which is very easy, www.fda.gov, click under CEDAR, click under Industry, and then there's links to small businesses. And there are, there are links there that will take you out of the FDA website to the Small Business Administration, and there are specific grant mechanisms there that can help uh, with drug development and product development for small companies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and just to reemphasize the point that I keep reemphasizing, is this is another opportunity, I think, for our um, research community, for our advocate and patient community to partner, this time with drugs and drug developers. Um, and we, we even had uh, one of the drug companies speak yesterday in our public testimony, so you know who that person is. Maybe you can partner with him. Um, so again, these are opportunities, I think, for the energy that I see in, the, in these and the committed people around CFS to really find new partners, new collaboration, new nurturing opportunities. So with, I'm on my soapbox. Uh, with that, um, Deborah willis Flinger is going to talk about HRSA. Well, actually, I had said that there wouldn't be much um, from HRSA because we are um, a, an organization that 
supports direct care services, uh, community organizations, and, and, and other non-for-profits that provide direct care and or uh, infrastructure support for health care services. We don't have specific funding for, um, for uh, chronic fatigue, ME, or other uh, specific diseases. So the best way, um, and now the example that I had given back last November was the family to family network that was being funded at that time. And as you, you heard, those, um, those awards have been announced in May. Uh, there isn't anything similar to that at this point. Um, but we do have our website, uh, www.hersa.gov, and there's a link for funding opportunities. So between now and the next meeting, it'd be useful to keep an eye on that site. Uh, for additional funding announcements. And, and Deborah, if you'll let us know, we can mm -hmm. add it to our Absolutely. CIFSAC and to uh, let it know, let, send out the information on the listserv. So yes. that's great. Mm -hmm. um, the Big Gorilla can talk again. <laughs> this is just the Big Gorilla on research, right? Thank you. Because we ha the Big Big Gorilla in HHS is CMF. <laughs> they have the big budget, but they don't have as much research opportunities. So I, I think it's during my presentation earlier, I, I highlighted what really is the, the thrust of NIH in terms of supporting research, and that was the use of investigator-initiated versus targeted research um, solicitations, if you will, to stimulate a field or encourage a field of research in a specific area. Um, those are really the things that, that we do, um, and we do actively seek out uh, potential um, uh, investigators when we go to meetings in our specialized areas of, of expertise. Uh, whenever an individual goes to a meeting, they are always a target for uh, researchers to speak with, and uh, they do that. That's part of their job is to encourage people to apply for research um, in any and, and all areas that they are qualified and eligible to apply. In. Um, there are there, and I, I did speak about some other opportunities that that I thought might be potentials um, with regard to collaborations. Uh, and like I said earlier, um, there are limited funds, and there are a lot more people seeking funding. And it's it's not the uh, when when I was younger, and uh, and seeking funding, um, it, it was you know one investigator, one grant, one investigator, one grant or one investigator, if you were lucky, two grants uh, that would be funded. Um, that world, I think, is, is going away very rapidly. Um, we are in a team environment. We're in a multidisciplinary research environment. We're in an environment where, they're, where the techniques that are available are expensive. Um, technologies are not cheap. If you want to look at, if you want to do MRIs or, or do advanced testing or do uh, genomic testing, or any omics testing, those resources are expensive. And it's no longer a period where we can simply just um, apply for a grant, where researchers can apply for a grant and get that grant and do all of the research that this world uh, now demands. So those are the things that, that NIH does, is we, we are trying to leverage as much as we can um, with the money we have and trying to bring people together, bring resources together, support the infrastructure so it is available, for example, like the CTSAs. That infrastructure support is available. Um, the, there are two things I'd like to emphasize, and they're, they're a little bit somewhat different. Um, one is that when, when I discussed earlier, and we've heard it also about registries, patient registries, um, what I think would be a really great idea and this is something that, that everyone can uh, advocate for, do not need to be an advocate, but you can advocate for, is the um, development of repositories. Repositories for biological samples, repositories for data, data collection uh, of any type. Um, and this, is, this presents an opportunity because if you have a repository of data samples that are available for use, um, already collected data. What this does is once those data are harmonized and they're all collected similarly and the, 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 the data are all mean the same thing essentially in that database, once you have that, that, prevents an that presents an opportunity for secondary data analysis. So if, if my research question is different from the next person's research question but we still need the same type of data, we can ask different questions. 
and even if we don't find an answer or if our answer is unclear, it's a source of, of information that would present an opportunity for hypothesis testing and for hypothesis generation. And it, so we're not limited by what should I do and how should I collect those data. Um, the question is, is different. It's here are a set of data and you know, what can I ask? How, what type of hypothesis do I have and how can I ask that and, and can these data help me? Um, that's a very inexpensive type of experiment is secondary data analysis, very inexpensive. Uh, the data are already there, it's collected. And I think that presents also a very good opportunity. Um, there are other reasons. Will NIH fund applications for such data registries? Patient registries? Is that is that an opportunity? Uh, an opportunity always exists for individuals who would like to submit an application for developing a data repository. Yes. And there may be some other opportunities for that vehicle um, that are not yet available. Um, but one other thing I'd like to mention, and, and this is an important point because I think this involves not just our, our committee sitting here, but our advocates who are in the room. Um, NIH, as I said, supports much of the research they support as investigator initiated. Even when there's a targeted solicitation or targeted um, funding opportunity announcement out there, uh, for example, on MECFS, um, we have to receive applications in order to review them and potentially fund them. Uh, there are not very many applications submitted for MECFS. This is a problem because if we can't get the applications in and review them and fund those that score well, then we can't fund MECFS research. And I, I know the second, the, the thing that's popping into everyone's head is, well, hello, why don't you just issue a request for applications, put some money behind it, put some, you know, put some, some teeth in there. Um, what I've noticed, and this is uh, working for a different institute and center uh, within NIH, but um, I'm sure you'll know which one it is, is that even though you put out an RFA, a request for applications, and attach funds to it, there is no obligation to spend that money if the applications are not well crafted and they do not address the questions that are asked or that are um, suggested as areas of research within that request for application. So even if applications do come in uh, in, re in response to a request for applications with a set aside amount of money, there's no guarantee that that research will move forward if the applications again do not score well or do not address the questions that um, NIH is seeking to answer. And this is something that, that uh, the working group is struggling with is how do we get people to submit applications? How do you get them in? And that's why we're trying to do as much uh, outreach by attending meetings in our areas of, of scientific expertise and reaching out to people, reaching out to people who are not in the MECFS research area but have unique approaches and ideas um, and reaching out to those who are in the field. And letting that, letting those people cross communicate, and letting that research um, suggestions and ideas uh, cross fertilize to try and move the field forward. And, and that's our goal. And so those are, uh, I guess, all the opportunities I can, well, I can think of a couple more, but um, that's what that's I would end with. And, and I know that uh, there, fortunately, um, Susan put together a PowerPoint that has lots of the details in it and that will be available uh, on our website when, once we get them in the, in the right compliance. Um, and just to sort of, I've heard this before in talking with Susan and with other um, leaders at NIH, that if they don't have a lot of applications through the R01 process, then there's concern that there's not a research community out there that can respond to a more targeted RFA. Uh, let me just for people who, who I mean, it's it can get a little confusing. There's the investigator initiated, which is the stuff that mainly NIH funds, and they send out a thing and say, send us back some ideas. The other kind is the kind that said we 
we have uh, a need for a specific topic, and here's some money if you can give us an application. So those are the requests for proposals. And I think there is also a hesitancy if there's not a lot of investigator-initiated issues on, on chronic fatigue syndrome, then to say, well, if, there, if we don't have that coming in, how do we know there's investigators out there who have the capacity to respond to a specific request for proposal? So again, here is an opportunity for the CFS community, both researchers and patients and advocates, to really build, nurture, collaborate, and work with the, our academic environment to build those. Um, let's have some questions, and Eileen, go ahead. When you say request for proposals, is that synonymous with an RFA? Uh, yeah. Yes, technically a grant it would be submitted. Uh, a request for application is the terminology used for grants and cooperative agreements in, in the NIH world. A request for proposals in the NIH world is used for contracts. And, and we can get those, but they, they typically have a specific Typically, requests for applications will have a, a set-aside amount of funding that will be dedicated at the time that the solicitation goes out for that particular request. Uh, applications will come in, they'll be reviewed, if, if, and then the uh, grants or the applications will then be funded in the order of their score, how well they did, until the money runs out in that set-aside. If there are insufficient applications within that set aside, the money doesn't get used for that, obviously. Okay, and I, and I had a question for Deborah. Um, I love everything that you always talk about with HRSA, your programs. And I just want a clarification. I know that they have a focus on AIDS, is, but everything else in HRSA is not disease specific. And if that's the case, and I would never begrudge any disease group for getting anything, but why AIDS and why not CFS? Uh, CFS has way more sufferers and also tend to fall into low income population, do you know? That's a historical, uh, I, yeah, it's right, it's called, the, there's a Ryan White Care Act that was passed, I guess it's been 20, almost 20 years ago. Um, and that was because at the time people were dropping dead and no one understood why and the numbers were increasing and continue to increase worldwide. Um, and there was a desire to provide uh, decent services for, for, for that population. It's a, it, it's, um, we're, I think the Ryan White reauthorization will be, is being uh, considered right now for, the, for, future, for future years and future funding now that there is treatment. Uh, available to patients both for uh, care and prevention. Um, those funds uh, w uh, may be re-diverted into basic primary care um, in the future, but at, at present, uh, that's, I, I can't explain it in, in any, any other way. I mean, I think uh, the, 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 the size of the epidemic, the um, uh, political support and advocacy around that particular disorder, obviously the catastrophic uh, um, uh, impact of HIV AIDS as well as the uh, infective nature and spread. There are lots of other reasons why those kinds of diseases, that particular disease is a high profile uh, disorder and um, particular care was, was needed. Part of the, the challenge was not only uh, that it is the, the there is a catastrophic imp impact and and um, it continues to spread, but also uh, that uh, there's a fair amount of of pop of of education um, that needs to be um, provided to the public about prevention um, and uh, and an appropriate treatment in order to to stem that epidemic and control it. Susan, I have a couple of questions, and I don't know if we're going to have time to address both of them, but. Beth, you were talking about, if you could explain to us what a registry entails, like is it providing the disease state of a, of a I guess, a de-identified individual and um, what more is involved with a registry. And then I wanted to ask Elaine, please, uh, to give an example, if she could, of, of um, the kind of coordinated care that you're looking for that would reduce, like I'm thinking maybe care of chronic illness like hypertension. Um, what would be an example of applications that 
would, would it be like having a special, somebody see a specialist just once a year and educating the primary care about that illness? What would be an example of cost reduction that you're looking for that may have been implemented already? So patient registry is uh, a centralized place where individual uh, data about individuals is collected um, in order to follow them through time um, and um, evaluate a number of, um, of treatment options, uh, natural history. You'd search under like a subheading of sorts like hepatitis C, for instance. Yes. Oh, in, in terms of the registry of registries? Yeah. How would you, how would you access it and what, how would you search for something, you, a disease you're interested in? Uh, yes. You could search by disease. You could search by age range. You could search by a particular treatment to see where treatments are being used um, across registries. While we're talking about registries, the strongest registries are those that have one opinion <laughs> from a health services perspective is the strongest registries are those that include uh, biologic and clinical data. And the um, more patient-centralized, patient data, patient-centric data that are included, um, the better. So that may not be just um, clinician-reported data, but also patient-reported data as well as biologic data. Bringing it all, all to, together um, creates the, the, strongest, um, database, the strongest database. It, of course, that makes sense, but um, it um, makes a significant difference when you include the clinical data with the biologic data. And then the next generation is that which includes patient-level data, quality of life, patient-reported symptoms, um, those sorts of things. Uh, yeah, I want to answer your question. Yeah, uh, I don't. I, I'm not going to be able to give you a model in any kind of specific detail. Um, I will. You can, actually can get a lot of details from the Innovation Web, uh, Innovation Center website about what they've currently funded and, and different models that they're testing. But uh, an example of care coordination would be um, if you know someone has um, multiple. Um, multiple chronic conditions, uh, a primary care organization um, being paid perhaps an additional care management fee to really uh, help track, you know, the different uh, specialists that person is seeing, uh, maybe contact them at home, uh, you know, maybe using telemedicine to, uh, make, you know, check on whether they're adhering to their different regimes, that kind of thing. Um, that's just one example, and I think the cost savings come in the idea is that things that aren't traditionally reimbursed or not reimbursed enough to allow the providers to really have an incentive to do it m might be reimbursed, but then there would be savings down the road because the person would stay healthy or would re reduce hospitalizations, et cetera. Thank you very much. Um, so I think w w let's continue this discussion this afternoon because we have, we're eating into our, our, um, our, our com public comment period. Um, and well, actually, not our public comment. We're eating into our break because so, we're going to start promptly for, with public comments at 11:30. Um, so, pardon? It, we have a 10-minute break. Okay. Thank you. And thanks to all of the ex officios. We had a lot of good information today. <laughs>